Okay. Um, my talk was going to be about um, data-driven decision making, but I changed my mind. Um, because some of the data that we see right now is frankly not encouraging. Um, <laughs> times are tough right now. Um, that creates fear. Fear can lead to paralysis. Uh, so rather than hunker down, I thought I'd talk about six projects that could ta change publishing for the better. Um, here's 30 odd years of time. Here is unemployment rates over those 30 years. You can see us kind of at the end there, you know, on the spike upwards. Um, here's every recession that's happened in that time. Um, those are in pink. And here's the hopeful part. Here's stuff that happens when times are tough. First mouse-based computer, Xerox PARC, uh, the beginning of the 74 recession. At the end of that recession, Apple was founded. Next recession, Commodore 64 is out. Lotus 123 revolutionizes business computing. Um, in the, at the end of that, Macintosh app. Next one, HTML, Linux. At the end of that, peak unemployment, O'Reilly brings out the first book about the internet. Um, and at the recession immediately after September 11th in 2001, the iPod launches. And that's just technology. We can do the same thing with retail. Back in the 60 recession, Target, Walmart, 71 recession, uh, Len Reggio buys Barnes & Noble, and Starbucks founded, same year. Um, two after that, we have J.Crew, we have Costco founded, we have Waterstones chain in the UK startup. Um, and this is, I mean, a perfect example of survivor bias. I haven't shown you all the companies that failed during that time or the ones that were founded at other times. <laughs> but all I'm trying to show you is that interesting stuff can happen in tough times, especially for people that are willing to rethink what customers want. Everything we saw on those last two slides were companies that went, I think I've got an entirely different way of how I can serve this market. Um, and notice that all of those examples were about radical of what customers are interested in. So it's a time when times are tough. It's a time when people are looking for new beginnings. It's a time when development is cheaper, when infrastructure is cheaper, when people are willing to make deals, <laughs> whether they are partners or companies or people with technology to license. And your competition's busy because they've got other stuff to do, deal with. So with that in mind, you know, what is this talk really about? Well, if you're willing to believe that revolutionary things can come out of, digital time, uh, out of difficult times, the question really is, you know, what do you want your revolution to be? Um, and this got me thinking about what would be some things that you might look back on 10, 20, 30 years from now and say, wow, you know, that was kind of when things really started to change. And we're seeing a lot of that today. A lot of people are talking about specific things. Um, I gave it some thought. I asked some people who were much smarter than me, some people who've been in business longer than I had. And so I came up with six things that if someone paid some attention to, dedicated resources to, might shake some things up. And some of them are big industry-wide changes that would require a shift in the culture of the book industry. Some are small, two people in a garage kind of problems. All of them are doable. And because there's nothing worse than having some speaker go on and on about things that you should be doing and how you should innovate, uh, we're going to walk the talk because some of these are things that we're working on right now. Number one, I'm really interested in bibliographic data in the cloud. Publishers have data everywhere. They've got tons of stuff. They've got covers. They've got Onyx scan. They've got Onyx files. They've got price and availability files. And that data has all kinds of great stuff in it. It's got author bios and book descriptions and up-to-date prices and jacket copy. And publishers are working like crazy to make it available, to keep it up-to-date, to make it standards compliant. And yet for all of that, it is still shockingly hard to get. Um, your Amazon, and not if you're Indigo, and not if you're Bowker, and not if you're Baker and Taylor, but you know, all of whom have lots of resources and infrastructure to devote to collecting data. But then, you know, it tends to stay difficult to get at, or it's expensive to get at, or there are strings attached. It should be easy. It should be easy to find information about books. It should be easy to use it. It should be easy to experiment with. It should be easy to play with. So whether you are a blogger, or you're in the media, or you are at the Toronto Public Library, or you're at Book City, or you're an aggregator of data, or you're a community site, or you know, you're a publisher who doesn't want to cut and paste anymore, you should be able to get at this. You should be able to pull 
data from a web service. You should be able to get back a cover and a full bibliographic record and up-to-date pricing and availability. You should be able to push corrections back and associate other data with it. It should be dirt cheap. Um, it should be free for bloggers and free for hobbyists and free for experimental. And, you know, depends if you want to push a terabyte of stuff at a time that's got some bandwidth cost to it, but really it should be cheap. Let's make it easy to talk about books online. And we feel strongly about this, that access to bibliographic data is one of those things that is important to push innovation for books online. Um, and so we're going to see if we can do something about it. Um, we've launched a new project called biblioshare.org. We are collecting publisher Onyx covers uh, price and availability files starting now. We're going to use them in a bunch of different ways. We're going to feed BNC sales data and prospector with them. We're working with libraries and library wholesalers who want more efficient access to Canadian publisher data. And publisher support for this so far has been great. The data is starting to pour in hundreds of thousands of records. It's going to take some time to get going, um, but we think this could be a tremendous resource for the industry. You can talk to us more about it at biblioshare.booknetcanada.ca, go to biblioshare.org. Um, I want to hear from you, not just do you want to take part, but what would you do with it if you could get it? That's number one. Number two, we would like to see an XML publishing workflow that doesn't suck. Um, and by that I mean an XML workflow that won't kill editors, uh, that won't kill production managers. We all know that uh, there's been a lot of talk about the benefits of XML in the publishing creation chain. We know that it promotes usability, you can do segmenting, you can then convert into other formats, you can make it portable. And from the perfect XML workflow, we really want two things. We want markup that gives us content. Is it a recipe? Is it a recipe about brownies? Is it a hotel review? For some reason, hotel reviews in Venice seem to come up a lot in this. I think it's a wish fulfillment thing. Um, at the same time, we want structure. Is it a chapter? Is it a subhead? Is it a call out? Is it a because I want to sell a chapter to him so that he can put it on short covers so that we can sell some books by the chapter. Um, so we need both of those kinds of markup. Um, and so, you know, when we look at kind of how publishers are broken up, um, the production side is all over structure. But they're not going to make calls about what the content is about. Um, the author and the editor are all about content. But how do they share what they know? And so, you know, typically a publishing house looks something like this. You've got an author who's working in Word. You've got an editor who says they're working in Word, but really they're working in pen. You want them to work in Word. Um, and when it's all done, you know, you've got the designer who's working along in Quark or Adobe. Um, the production manager's creating PDFs, maybe some doc book, or they've got some 3B2 going with the compositor. And then from there we get galleys and books and EPUB, et cetera. Um, and that's kind of the way things are at publishing houses right now. So how do we get that XML goodness in back at the time when people actually know what the book is about. So you could do the O'Reilly approach, um, which doesn't cost much and is pretty lean and clean. Andrew may talk a little bit about that tomorrow. I'll give an entirely condensed version, which is XML all the way back to the editor, designers working in style sheets, XSLT, they're creating EPUBs and then a whole bunch of other stuff besides. Um, and you've got HTML for the web. I call it the Spartan. Um, it's rigorous, it's pure and strong and uncompromising, and it can adapt to any situation. It's minimal, and it will kill almost anyone. Um, because if you show this to editors, they start drinking at their desks. And that's already a problem. Um, so only a truly strong and disciplined can actually take that on. You've got other publishers uh, that do different things. You've got Wiley, who's kind of hybrid joined Word and style sheets and custom conversion uh, in a couple of different places. Um, they've written a lot of custom software and conversion tools to make that happen. You can learn all about the different <coughs> models and approaches that people have taken at uh, O'Reilly Start with XML site. Um, it'll show you how different publishers have tackled the problem, um, but all of them either have big startup costs or a huge culture change or both. This can definitely be better. So whether we're talking about editor-friendly XML or less torturous production workflows, the person who takes this on and really cracks the code 
is not only going to be a hero, but they're probably going to make out like a bandit because everyone is struggling with this right now. That's number two. Number three. What do I mean by DRM free? Let me explain. So here's the state of things. We had the Iliad, and we had the Sony Reader PRS 500, um, and then the Kindle with free newspaper, um, and then the Sony PRS 505 now with disembodied hands, um, <laughs> PRS 700 with 100% fewer disembodied hands but with grippy ridges and wireless, uh, Amazon comes back with the Kindle 2, one disembodied hand, better manicure, scary robotic voice. Um, <laughs> And then finally, the Plastic Logic Reader, which is kind of like Jesus, um, <laughs> in that it is perfect and will save the world, but only 12 people have seen it working and nobody knows when it's going to arrive. <laughs> so. And you could look at these things and say, look, they're getting better all the time. It's only a matter of time before we have the perfect reading device. But of course, they all have a problem. Um, I'm going to let Cory Doctorow and those guys deal with the pros and cons of digital rights management. Um, I'm concerned about something different. What I'm concerned about is that all reading devices are embedded with date repulsion mode. Um, and you know what I'm talking about. It's a carefully guarded secret at Amazon headquarters that no one holding a Kindle at a Starbucks has ever been asked for their phone number. Um, <laughs> there's a reason they use the disembodied hand. Like, so you know, now DRM, like all things, is relative. In fact, there is, there is actually a scale. Um, so at the bottom, we have Renaissance Fair costumes. And then we have homemade Star Trek jewelry. Uh, and then somewhere between Bluetooth headsets and the speak and spell, we have the readers, which are followed by Zunes, iPhones, and iPods, then books that make you look smart, and finally, uh, Labrador puppies. Um, <laughs> and, you know, Michael and, uh, Mike and Neilan are sitting at the back going, excellent, I backed the right horse. Um, you know, but, but don't be so sure. After all, you know, who are you going to walk up to? Are you going to walk up to him or him <laughs> or her or her? She's busy with someone else. She's not going to talk to you. Yeah, she might. You never know. Um, <laughs> because as far as I've been able to tell, there are no buttons that say mobile electronics are sexy. Um, but that's the challenge. Make a device that makes us look smarter and more attractive than we actually are, just like books do. Um, <laughs> Michael Sabrinas and Neil Chosky are now thinking, how do I get e-books onto Labrador puppies? <laughs> um, and I have no idea what this should look like. I'm not an industrial designer, but that's the challenge. If we can make pink digital cameras and three pieces of fake vintage luggage for 199 bucks, if we can reimagine the watch and the kitchen knife, there's a thing I can hold in my hand that will not repel people. That's number three. Number four is looking at the whole question of frontless buying. Uh, the frontless buy is the toughest job in books. Um, because really, whether the, it isn't about whether the book is good or worthy, it's about how many people want it. And if there's one thing we know about people, it's that they're bizarre and they're unpredictable. Um, so let me give you a sense of how hard this is. Last year, there were about 90,000 new titles ordered, stocked, or sold in the Canadian supply chain. So here are the top 30,000 of those 90,000. This pretty much represents every book that sold more than 50 copies in the Canadian market. The other 60,000, not even on this map, uh, sold less than 50, or they'd been ordered but not stocked, or they were special orders, or you know, technical manuals, whatever. Um, so the green ones here have sold 500 or more, and 1,000 or more, and 5,000 or more, and 10,000 or more, 25,000 or more, again, just the green ones, 50,000 or more, and here are green books um, that sold 100,000 copies or more, are dark green dots. Welcome to the Canadian book market. Um, now, if we were a purely digital world, this wouldn't matter. You'd have all the files ready and people could buy what they want. But since Canada, anyway, we're still looking at about 99.5% of book sales in paper, it means that there are decisions to make. How much stock, how much store space, does it go on the front page of the website or not? 
and to sift those 90,000 titles down to real buying decisions the buyer has to rely on the sales rep and their own experience, maybe some of their own historical sales if they bought the last ones right, um, and the catalog. Or as they say in America, the catalog. Um, <laughs> And I've been thinking about the challenges to frontless buy, and I've been very interested in catalogs lately. First of all, there are a lot of them. Um, tens of thousands of, uh, thousands of catalogs, tens of thousands of copies, and they have this really interesting status inside publishing houses. Catalogs are the talisman. They are obsessed over. Great care is given to their design. They are obsessively proofread, and as soon as they are completed, they are shipped across the country at great expense at which point they immediately become out of date. Um, and then prices are changing, and marketing plans are changing, and titles are dropping out, and I'm writing stuff in. Um, and then half of it doesn't get read, because if you've ever bought from catalogs, you know the back half is all back with stuff you already know about, so you don't even look at that. And in fact, a good sales rep's job is to go through the catalog with you and say, yeah, let's skip that. That's not for you. Um, and then it's used once, and then it's thrown away. So there seems to be an opportunity here. Um, so you certainly could put them online, and that makes sense. Most publishers have downloadable catalogs today, um, but buyers are driven crazy by having to go through a thousand PDFs from a hundred different publishers. So you could consolidate them. You could have publishers consolidating catalog offerings down through a single service, and that's a start. But we think the catalogs could do a lot more. Um, and let's look at one to see what I'm talking about. Um, now let me first say that the House of Anansi Press has no foreknowledge at all that I was going to showcase their catalog. Um, so let me say it looks fabulous. Um, second, if there are retailers in the house, you should buy a boatload of this um, because it's going to be a fantastic book, but only as big a boatload as you need because uh, Sarah does not like returns. Um, so trust that I will treat this with, with gentle care. So we're looking at Lisa Moore's much anticipated new novel, February, coming out, oddly, in June. Um, <laughs> what else? And so we've, we've got a lot of good stuff that's in here. We've got a cover, we've got a description, we've got a bio, we've got some previous editions, uh, we've got luminous praise, we've got marketing plans. But what else could be happening here? Um, what if clicking on a previous title also brought you up the sales history for that title. Um, and more specifically, for the account where that catalog was being viewed. Um, and didn't just look at how the book had sold, but also looked at their stock position and their sell-through during the time that they had it. Because it could be that they had it but didn't treat it well. Or they had it but bought too much and should have bought less. Um, and let's look at that retailer in the context of the whole market. Was this a book that they missed? Was it one that they overperformed the market on? Was it one they underperformed the market on? Um, are there things that we can do to help guide that first frontless decision? The catalog could also enable the conversation between the buyer and the seller. So, you know, you should be able to say, here is stuff that's just for you, the retailer. Um, you should certainly be able to pull up media that's about this author from other places. Um, you should be able to give sample chapters or arcs directly to the buyer who needs them right now. And then beyond this, we'll leave Lisa Moore alone. You know, if we're looking at children's books, we should be able to present full color blads in PDF in real time without having to wait for them to come off the printer in China and ship them out to you. You should be able to custom assemble them so that they're right for each account. Uh, so that you see them in the order you want that buyer to see them in. They should be enriched with historical sales data, previous editions from the same author, and comp titles, marketing calendars, really everything that a buyer needs to make an informed decision to get the right number of books into their store. Um, we know this challenge isn't going away, and this is only going to get tougher. So let's look at the front list buying process that gives every book the best possible shot at its little green dot. This is another one where we're going to roll up our sleeves a bit. So starting this year, we're working on a new set of projects that combine BNC sales data, the rich bibliographic data that we're collecting for BiblioShare, some of the research that we've done on returns, um, and starting a set of projects that we're calling Collaborative Commerce, where we're going to be looking at publisher needs around what a catalog 2.0 might look like, how we can support the front list buying process. We don't want to get in the way of the front list buying process. We just want to make sure that there's stuff in front of the buyer and the seller at the time that they need it. 
And at the same time, we're going to go deep into the backlist as well. How can we help publishers and retailers identify titles that are performing well but are just under the radar? Collaborative commerce, number four. Number five, online browsing that makes you want to buy things. For all the advances in online book selling, I find it fascinating that the online shopping paradigm for books really hasn't changed since 1995. Since then, it's been homepage, subject page, list of books, single book. And with a few tweaks here and there, that's pretty much the way it's been for the last 13 or 14 years. Innovation has pretty much been confined to how can I get more stuff on that page or new ways to make lists of books. And, and obviously, this is very effective or these guys wouldn't be doing it. Um, but I, th I think like a lot of people, um, and as a, a voluminous book purchaser, I tend to search online. I go in with a title in mind, a book that I've read about or heard about. I run some searches. I find it. So I search online, but I browse in stores. Um, in stores, I can be random. I can wander around, both visually and mentally, and I can sort of subject myself to happy accidents. And bookstores are all about happy accidents. Why is it so hard to find happy accidents online? We're clearly pretty visual when it comes to books. Um, and it's not just that we keep creating more and more beautiful spaces in which to look at them so that we can walk around and have our happy accidents, but also because the books themselves are profoundly visual and often such achingly beautiful medium where huge amounts of attention gets paid to what the books look like. Um, and so that question of is there browse that's beyond lists and title pages, and some people have tried to crack this. So you've got folks like Zoomy, um, who will let me zoom around inside a nearly infinite collection of book covers. Um, there are sites like CoverPop, big random pile of stuff organized by genre. Um, Oscope, who are focusing on visual search. I can go to MS Type uh, from Japan, where I can type in the word Canada, and I can get a pile of book covers about Canada arranged in the shape of the word Canada. Um, <laughs> And these, you know, are all, um, <laughs> but none of them actually make me want to buy anything. You know, at the end of the day, they're about uh, the developer's skill in man manipulating Amazon Web Services. They're about Ajax. They're about dynamic image and data management. They are technical exercises. Um, and it could be that at the end of the day, the difference comes down to curation, that maybe it isn't about having everything. Maybe it's about actually having less. Or maybe it's just me. Um, but I, the whole idea of online browsing as opposed to online search and select is something that I find really interesting. Um, and that is number five. Number six, and my last one, deals with technology, innovation, uh, culture, and publishing. And this one is kind of dear to my heart. When you hear people talk about it, publishing is kind of the quintessential plateau industry in the sense that you know, there are rules that people play by. There are roles uh, in plateau industries that tend towards a high degree of specialization. And so how can you tell if you're working in a plateau industry? You know, how easy is it for you to leave your job in this industry and go and work in another one? A lot of people stay in publishing for a really long time and never go anywhere else, um, which is not a bad thing, but it's a sign that there's a huge amount of specialization built up around roles inside publishers. Lots and lots of benefits to this because specialization brings skill and efficiency and optimization and institutional memory. But the downside is the more you specialize, change gets harder. Um, because when change comes, specialization brings resistance. Am I going to get left out in the cold by this change? Am I going to be able to keep up? Am I going to lose influence? Am I going to lose staff? Am I going to lose my job for that 24-year-old with a lean and hungry look? Um, and that makes people resistant to change. Um, there are other industries that have found themselves in this place um, who also found themselves to be relatively resistant to change. So is this you? And this is a choice. This is a choice that every organization gets to make. And so there's things that you can do. Uh, when you're in meetings and someone asks about trying something new, how often do you hear, well, that's really hard and you know, there are a lot of reasons why. You know, we, can't, we just can't do that right now. Um, and how often is it, I wonder how we could do that. And not to say that we can or that we've got the money, but I wonder if we could, I wonder how. Um, in publishing, the big challenge is around the intersection of innovation and technology. Uh, specialization means that IT people 
tend to get shoved into the back office to take care of the SAP system or to configure the warehouse management system or to keep the servers running. Um, the technology is operations. Um, and yet with the explosion of the web, there's never been a greater need for publishers and retailers too to look at people who can think across technology and their love of books and their understanding of the reader and what she wants, um, online culture and how it can be leveraged to build new things. It's about getting past the first stage of being a tool user. We do Facebook and Twitter and blogs and, and so on, but how do we do something that someone else is doing? How do we become a tool maker? And to do this, we need to change a couple of things. When traditional companies bring creative technologists in, they tend to kind of break them on the wheel a little bit. And a lot of you may have had this, this conversation. You know, we're really excited about your new idea. Great, all we need is full specifications, use cases, fully developed test plan, low testing model, and you know, the cover sheet for your TPS report. Um, I'm glad some people got that. Um, oh, and if it isn't successful, you're fine. Um, so go crazy, happy to have you on board. Um, and so to bring creative technology in, companies have to embrace a bit of startup culture uh, inside their organizations. You know, when was the last time you saw this word on a publisher's website? Um, getting things out, trying things, trying things quickly is something that we could do more of. Um, we could encourage spe specialization. We could also let generalists in. Um, let's kind of break down the barriers that we have around, well, you know, we need a publishing focused 20 years of experience person who's been doing this for a long time and bring in somebody who can hack some PHP and configure a database, but also do other stuff, have an opinion about the books they're doing and be willing and able to talk and converse with editors and marketers. Um, and you know, at BookNet, we're kind of like that. We have retailers and publishers, sure, but we also have writers and librarians and cooks and composers and software developers who can do propane repair. And uh, we've got a theater technician and a philosopher. Um, and it's all about finding people who can kind of enrich the conversation. And at 1 a.m. in the morning, I had uh, an email back from Shane Kennedy from Lone Pine, um, who if you ever want to talk about diversity in hiring and hiring people from interesting backgrounds, he's the guy. Shane, wave your hand. Thank you. Um, so you don't have to be a big publisher to do this. You can be a medium size. You can be a small publisher. It's about kind of breaking down some of those walls and bringing in people from different backgrounds who can enrich the environment. Place a lot of little bets in place. Um, IT does not have to be big spend and big heavy lifting anymore. There's lots of infrastructure that you can leverage that cost almost nothing. And learn to roll with and live from little failures. You're going to place a lot of bets. You're going to lose some. And when you get a winner, commit resources to it and really make it go. Um, and this, again, is something that we believe in. It's a part of how we do things. Um, but we also want to help other people bring technology and innovation to their companies. Um, one of the ways that we do that is this. Um, but another is that this year, we're the exclusive um, sponsor of Bookcamp TO. Um, we're taking the money that we would have used for a booth at Book Expo, and we're underwriting all of the expenses for Bookcamp so that people can come together and figure out what you want your revolution to be. Thank you. I have time for a couple of questions if anyone wants one. And if you were counting, that's 239 slides in just under 30 minutes. <laughs> Thanks very much, everybody.